Hello, everyone. Um, we'll be starting the webinar in a few moments. Could you please type into the question box uh, that your sound and visual is okay? This will be really helpful for us. Thank you. Very good. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Best Start by Health Nexus, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health in an Indigenous Context. My name's Yolande Lawson and my coworker, Hiltrude Dawson, will be helping me with the questions at the end of the webinar. I'd like to first begin this webinar by acknowledging that we're gathered on the Indigenous land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. We're grateful for the opportunity to meet together and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. The Health Nexus office in Toronto is located on the historical territory of the many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. The city also acknowledges that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with the multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Today, Toronto is the home of many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in this territory. So we're really excited to have so many of you joining us from across Ontario and Canada. A few bit of housekeeping before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and we will share the link um, to this webinar with you in a follow-up email. You'll notice the webinar sidebar on your screen. In the handout tab that's there on the right side of your screen, you'll find a PDF copy of today's slides if you'd like to keep them for future reference. You also will see the question tab and we encourage you to enter any question you have throughout the presentations. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Due to the large number of participants that we have online today, we may not get to all of your questions, but we'll do our best to reply to any of the unanswered questions after the webinar. So before we start today's webinar, um, one moment. Okay, one moment. I'm just having problems with my slides here. But before we start with today's webinar, um, I wanted to talk uh, to you about Best Start by Health Nexus. Um, Best Start by Health Nexus produces multimedia resources in multiple languages um, on a broad range of topics related to preconception health, prenatal health, and early child development. Um, most of our resources can be downloaded free of charge and many of them can be adapted for local use. Um, contact Best Start for more information on our resources. Our electronic bulletins help you stay up to date on current trends and our online networks, listservs, help you to exchange ideas, strategies, and best practices with other service providers and experts. So if you're interested in joining one of our listservs, please go to www.beststart.org and sign up. So today we're excited to have presenting with us Joanne Robertson and Donna Hill, both from Infant Mental Health Promotion with Sick Kids Hospital. Joanne Robertson has a background in child development and public health. After a presentation by infant psychiatry at SickKids, she was a convert to infant mental health and completed the infant mental health certificate program. Joanne has worked in a variety of community set, um, settings with children zero to six years and their families. Her interests and areas of learning include equity and access, hospitalized infants and young children, and culturally competent practice working with Indigenous partners and communities. Our next speaker today will be Donna Hill, and she's been working with Infant Mental Health Promotion for almost 15 years, organizing and learning from a wide range of education events that have been hosted. Her focus at um, Infant Mental Health Promotion is in developing content, managing the promotion dot, the IM, 
P, um, hppromotion.ca website and coordinating education events. Donna is of um, Six Nation Mohawk background and has been a key team member in the development of the Nurturing the Seed resource. Um, a constant learner, she's currently pursuing further education in psychology and Indigenous cultural safety. And I'll now hand over the presentation to Joanne and Donna, who will lead today's webinar. We're having a few issues with advancing the slides at the present time. So um, as soon as we can get that um, rectified, we'll be uh, advancing the slides um, to match where the presenters are at. Our apologies for that. Let me just get out of that way. Sorry. So I'm Joanne Robertson, and um, as Yolande stated, I'm with the Infant Mental Health Promotion Team at Sick Kids. And just a little bit about our organization. We um, are not involved with the treatment of little ones, infants, toddlers, and young children with mental health um, concerns. We're really focusing on the promotion of mental health from the earliest years so that we can actually prevent some mental health challenges later in life. So our work encompasses work across the country and um, our vision is to improve outcomes across the lifespan. And we know that the early years matter so much across the lifespan. Our website is www.imhpromotion.ca and if you want to visit that we've got a number of resources and we also sell membership for more enhanced access to our, our resources, um, our webinars that are recorded and all sorts of learning tools that you may find helpful in your practice. One moment, please. We're just um, I'm just going to share the correct screen. Okay, monitor two, and I think we're back in business. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So when we think about childhood, there. Some people um, who know child development are always amazed at the tasks of childhood and what's undertaken. But when you think about this is what young children, babies, toddlers, and young children need to learn all throughout childhood to become successful adults. So they need to develop a strong and secure attachment relationship. They need to modulate external sensory input. So that's like being able to manage when there's loud noises, manage when you're cold. And you also need to learn to identify internal affect states, both positive and negative. So that's your feelings, things like anger and disappointment, as well as joy and excitement. Effectively communicate and get needs met. So that's um, being able to tell people when you need their help, when you're hungry, when you're tired and you wanna lie down. Um, those are all skills that children need to learn. And finally, children need to learn to problem solve and that will help them to deal with the changing world that we live in. So what is infant and early mental health? It is three things that really form the core components of um, early mental health. And the first thing is the ability to form close and secure adult and peer relationships. So we often think of attachment with primary caregivers as being important for mental health, and it is. Um, attachment is a key foundation of infant mental health, but we also know that the, the ability to form close and secure relationships with peers is also essential for good mental health. The second thing is to experience, manage, and express a full range of emotions. 
So just because a child is happy does not mean that they're experiencing good mental health. We want kids to be able to experience a full range of emotions and be able to manage those emotions. So that includes things like being tired, being angry, being frustrated. Those are also signs of good mental health when a child's able to not acknowledge them and express them. And finally, it's about exploring the environment and learning. And if a child has good mental health, it allows them to use the resources they have in the adults around them to feel safe enough to go out into the environment and learn. And that learning happens in the context of family, community, and culture. What's the most important thing we'll talk about today in terms of early and infant mental health is that over a million neural connections are made every second in the first three years of life. So imagine you're born with all these neurons, but they don't communicate well with each other. And neural connections are formed through experience. So when you have positive early experiences, you form pathways in the brain that are supportive to early and um, early mental health. And if you have negative experiences, unfortunately, those also get wired into the brain. And that can lead to um, problems with coping, problems with um, developing long-term mental health in the long run, and that lasts across the lifespan. I'm gonna show you a video. Um, this video is two minutes and, oh, I've, I've lost it. There he is. This is baby Jordan, and um, we'll watch it. It's I'm going to show it to you just because it's cute, because why not? Okay, so we'll stop the video because apparently there's no audio and that makes it very frustrating to watch a video. Um, but that being said, this is a little baby who's seven days old and he's got his grandfather looking at him. And what they do is they engage in a little dance together. They're communicating with each other and they're looking each other in the eye. And when grandfather changes his mouth shape, the baby changes his mouth shape. and this communication, again, the baby's seven days old, and that communication and that building of relationships starts right from day one, and that's the goal of infant mental health promotion, is to build those really solid um, connections in the brain based on experience that tell you the world is safe and you are with me and I'm understood. And those again, allow people to form good peer relationships, strong peer relationships and allow kids to experience um, the environment and to learn. So relationships build brains and that's the connections we want kids to have. Relationships are foundational to the task to achieve the tasks of childhood and they're as important as good nutrition and we know from research studies um, in the Romanian orphanages that kids who are fed and taken care of will not develop um, typically and will actually experience behaviors that are very similar to autism or significant developmental delay if they don't have close relationships. And that's what they found when they did the research in Romania. And we know that 
good relationships they influences brain architecture or how the brain is built and it can be the most protective factor that a child has so children who are living in um, really adverse environments can do well some of them can actually thrive in the in the company of a supportive adult relationship when we think of social emotional development a lot of people will say oh well it's the ability to make friends and and maybe to talk about how you feel and actually it's really complicated these are some of the developmental or the behavioral areas of social emotional development and as you can see they're a little bit um there's a lot more to it than just the making of friends. So if you think about things like self-regulation, interaction with people, autonomy, affect, all of these areas really um, set the stage for social emotional development, which is, is a key area of infant mental health. So what makes it challenging? It's challenging because young infants and toddlers don't really talk to us. They can't tell you, oh, I'm not feeling good. I'm a little bit down today. Um, of course, their cues are often subtle. It's difficult to distinguish between typical development and behaviors that are concerning because in little ones, we expect two-year-olds to have temper tantrums. But when do we decide that that's a problem? And we don't often consider the family, the child's family history. So things like during pregnancy, how was the birth? What was the mother's um, childhood stressors herself? All of those things impact the child's mental well-being early in life. And it makes it a bit of a puzzle to figure out when children are not doing well in these early age groups. So here are some quick facts about infant mental health. Infants do have mental health. And sometimes people will say mental health um, and mean mental illness or mental health concerns. But in this context, I'm using mental health as a good thing. So you can substitute that word with mental well being. It's possible to recognize poor mental health during infancy. Infants and toddlers who experience neglect are not getting the help they need. And we know that happens in a variety of settings and particularly in child welfare. Toddlers and infants are often seen as um, observers. Oh, and there's a baby in the family. Oh, and there's a two-year-old. But they don't get the same attention that the older children might get. And we know that the babies and the toddlers are also suffering. Um, this is interesting because a lot of people, this misconception comes up often, is that infants attach to caregivers regardless of the quality of care. So infants will form an attachment to anyone who takes care of them. They don't just form an attachment to people who are responsive and predictable and caring. Bonding and attachment are not the same thing. And if you want to know more about that, we can talk about that at the end. Um, babies don't remember negative experiences in a verbal memory kind of way, but they're ingrained in the neurobiology of the baby. So they're embedded in the body and they're embedded in the brain. Um, early experiences really count towards what happens in schools and infants and toddlers have to learn to begin to regulate before they start school. Mental health risk can be identified before children start school, so we don't have to wait for that to start identifying and supporting children. And it's easier to address mental health issues before the child reaches the school system because of the malleability of that brain when those neural connections are being formed. So, so this is Donna Hill, and I'm going to sort of start uh, talking a little bit more focused on Indigenous uh, culture and issues. Um, so from what we've just heard from Joanne about the importance of secure attachments and uh, healthy relationships, we know from um, extensive research that intergenerational trauma is a very real thing when it comes to Indigenous families. So there are um, extensive, you know, examples of racism and stereotypes that have imp intense impacts on uh, a child and family's well-being. Um, so we know about 
uh, residential school and the traumas that have happened there. And those traumas are transmitted through generations, through the relationships that may be at risk um, uh, because of various um, effects of the trauma, such as uh, unresolved loss. Um, and uh, um, so we need to uh, think about how these trauma might affect parenting behavior. So unresolved trauma and loss um, will affect the ability for an individual to cope with, um, with difficulties and that arise in life. Um, it affects there's when there's separation from caregivers that's a trauma for both the child and the parents and we know that still uh, indigenous families are being separated into foster care system at a really alarming rate and um and this these are these are traumatic experiences for uh, both the child and the family and uh, we know that likewise it when children are perhaps uh, placed into foster care, which is a separation from their culture and community, that also has damaging effects. Um, so the, the traumas that uh, Indigenous people experience are very much relationship-based. And um, historically, a lot of these abuses have been perpetrated by those who have been expected to care for those those individuals and support them um, and instead of being cared for in residential school we know that that there were um, horrific experiences of abuse um, and nutrition experience uh, experiments where um, individuals have lost their sense of autonomy and their sense of of self um, self-efficacy so these trauma experiences can lead to parenting behaviors that look like dissociation or not being able to assess risks. Um, so there might be more instances of um, dangerous activities, for instance, happening around that child. Um, there might be trust issues or experiences of live, reliving trauma um, and unfortunately substance use um, often again as a self-medication against that emotional distress that is uh, difficult to manage. So these parenting uh, behaviors, you know, when, when we see through a Western lens, um, if you were, say, a home visitor, you go into a home, you see that the pantry is almost bare. Um, that might be a, a red flag for you, but you might have to sort of switch your lens to understand that that family um, hunts for their food and they share food as a community rather than having that pantry full, stocked full. There, there is a an intense support network in the community that also um, is is supporting that child and family. Um, so you might also see families that encourage autonomy and independence from a young age, you know, go out and, and run in the bush and uh, play. That might be seen as neglecting their safety, but that outside play and being able to go and be an autonomous individual exploring the environment is an important part of development when seen through an Indigenous lens um, as well. There are uh, examples where um, historically uh, um, Indigenous uh, folks were thought of as uh, neglecting their parental responsibilities because they didn't punish their children or didn't physically abuse their children, His, like going way, way back, way back <laughs> um, to Indian Act uh, and such. Uh, these, uh, this might be seen as neglecting parental responsibilities um, or likewise families if they don't take the child to the doctor it might be seen as neglecting the child's health needs when there is that um, dissociative relationship with that healthcare system that can be very difficult for for families to manage so when we see these these 
parenting behaviors from a Western perspective. It makes us really uncomfortable and really nervous, but we do need to uh, realize that we need to approach families and young children with these principles of trauma-informed care. So we need to be aware that children and families may have experienced um, trauma through from residential school, from various uh, um, instances of racism, for instance. And um, we need to um, be aware that those traumas have connections with their addictions and mental health concerns. And we need to consider this trauma through the eyes of the individual. So focusing on their unique story and their unique needs um, in order to create safety and trust um, to be able to serve families with compassion and without judgment and ensure that they have that choice of collaboration. So um, increasing their own health safety competence, for instance, um, in order to empower children and family to be able to make healthy decisions and continue to build healthy relationships, focusing on their strengths recognizing that change is possible if, if and when they need it and that recovery from trauma is possible. Now also we need to consider that not all families will have these, um, these specific traumas. So again, we need to really understand that individual experience in order to support them moving forward. Um, and so trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive care from a, a service provider's perspective really requires self-awareness. You need to be aware of the biases and beliefs, values and assumptions that you have regarding a certain culture, regarding certain parenting practices, regarding um, you know, everything that you do in life really. Uh, and use that self-awareness in a compassionate way to build a connection with the client, to motivate them to, to uh, move forward in a good way and be empathetic um, and understanding of their journey um, and being able to accept that people are not perfect, but there are ways that you can help to motivate through these, these um, uh, tenants, if you will, of uh, self-awareness, compassion, empathy, and collaboration to serve families and help them uh, towards a good path for their, for their child and family and mental health and well-being. So uh, we have at Infant Mental Health Promotion developed a resource and a, an intervention model called Nurturing the Seed, um, which is about creating developmental support plans for Indigenous children. So uh, this was born out of uh, uh, a model called Hand in Hand um, to build specific support strategies that are um, entirely based on that child's unique needs and their goals in order to help them towards the next developmental milestone. So we know from working with many um, groups that sometimes when a baby is late in his or her development, a little help can make a big difference in the long run towards meeting those developmental goals. So during this process, we uh, we were very cautious to be a, um, to engage with Aboriginal advisors from across the country um, because we were approached to to develop this um, resource for Indigenous families, but we know very quickly that we wanted it to be as inclusive as possible. But there is such an amazing amount of diversity amongst Indigenous communities across this country that there's no way that one document can tell you all of the views and cultural perspectives of all Indigenous peoples. But when there are very there there are similarities in experiences, um, there are also differences. So we wanted to develop a resource that was sensitive to Indigenous needs, um, but not specific to uh, specific cultures. If, uh, so we wanted to approach this resource um, with two key principles, to focus on building strong relationships between the child and family, between the family and the service provider, and use an Indigenous lens. 
So we want to um, incorporate the concept of two-eyed seeings. So learning from one eye with the strengths of Indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, and from the other with the strengths of Western knowledges and ways of knowing, and trying to marry those two worldviews um, into, uh, into a, a model to assist families to support their child development. So um, there are, uh, we learned that in many native languages, there is actually no word for development because it's seen as a holistic process that just continues through life. Um, and individuals are seen as really walking a path uh, as we grow and learn. And cult indigenous cultures are strengths-based, not deficit-based, which is co sort of contrary to some Western um, methodologies and spirituality is really integral to growth so that is the idea of self-identification self-determination and um, being able to say that you're walking life as a you know, on a good path and um, for children in particular they are really seen as gifts from the creator there they've just come through um, that eastern door and they're very close to the creator and the spirit world and they are there to absorb and <laughs> and um develop them their their life while going on this path um towards you know doing the good life the fast life wandering life so not everybody in the indigenous community will ascribe to the medicine wheel. I've found it a very helpful pedagogical tool to be able to teach people about the holistic view of, um, of, of some indigenous worldviews. Um, but definitely, I think the important thing is that the, the spirit and the self is, is placed in the center, but we have the um uh the the as we go through life we build and develop these capacities so we've related this back to the five domain domains of development um with uh rec recalling these back to how they connect with the heart the mind the body and the spirit of the child um in in that way so what can we do to nurture and support children in a holistic way that um, uh, creates opportunities for growth in all of these areas? So um, in our discussions with the advisors, we learned that children with different gifts were once seen as holy. So if you can imagine um, a child with autism, they might have been seen as being closer to the creator. Um, and each person in the community is raised to contribute their gifts and strengths to the betterment of the community. Um, so that's living that life path and being able to uh, contribute to that holistic sense of, of self and environment. Um, the community is there to keep you on a good path towards that concept of self-actualization and empowerment and really when it comes to raising a child it is about the whole community engaging to help them realize their gifts and be able to lead them down that good path in life so again in a western view you might see a child as hyperactive but from an indigenous view they might be energetic if you see sensory concerns from an indigenous view again, they might be seen as just being more sensitive to the environment, uh, hypervigilance versus sensitivity and attunement, uh, oppositional versus strong-willed and independent. So you can think of other examples where these, um, these things that might be seen in a Western view as deficits can actually be re reconstrued or uh, uh, recreated in a positive lens. Um, towards that strength-based approach with families. So I'm going to hand it back over to Joanne now. Thanks very much for your time. 
So now we're going to get into the um, heart of what developmental support planning is. So a developmental support plan creates a common tool for a child and those caring for that child, and it works on a child's strengths. It provides a goal for each domain, and what it does is it provides parents and caregivers with simple strategies they can use in everyday routines to support a child's achievement of the goals. So the key objectives are to promote positive parenting and supportive relationships. It's to provide an environment for healthy development, and that can happen in the context of families um, that may have more challenges, but we know that the developmental support plan is basically providing small opportunities for a really positive environment and a positive interaction. It's to minimize toxic stress in the baby's life to develop, um, develop enhanced activities between the parent and the child, and to coordinate with other health or service providers so that we're all working from the same plan and have the same goals for the child. Finally, ensures ongoing monitoring for children who may be at risk. So when you're building a plan, here's the four components of what informs your plan the first is a discussion with caregivers and it says interviews here but i don't think interviews are particularly effective i think it's a conversation with families to learn more about their child to learn more about their relationship with their child to learn more about what their goals are for their child and that that's one of the um foundations of how you build a plan the second thing is a developmental screening tool so we really encourage the use of a developmental screening tool because if you don't, you're going to be guessing if the child's development is on track or not. And often you have to wait until there's a significant sign that things aren't going well before you're able to address it. And developmental screening tools, particularly those that are validated, are really good at picking up the earliest indicators of a potential problem. They're not diagnostic, but they do help you identify potential areas that you can get straight away involved with the developmental support plan, and that can actually um, prevent those potential areas of, of um, developmental delay from actually occurring. You want to consult with your team members. Um, if you work in a team, it's always great to hear other people's opinions, what they've observed, what their thoughts are, and finally, your own observations. So the best thing is watching parents and children together. And I think of in a waiting room, um, we were watching a family come into the waiting room and the little girl, she would have been, I think, around 10 months old. and. Um, I, I was sitting in the waiting room and I, I waved to the little girl and said, hello, how are you? And she went and ran behind her mom and hid. And I was like, that's fantastic. That's exactly what we want to see at this age for the child to have some stranger anxiety and see, use her mom as a comfort if, um, if we're, we're thinking she's on track. So that's one example of observations in short amounts of time that you can get a sense of where the child and the family are at in their relationship. Here is a very small, um, meaning the font is very small, but this is an example of a developmental support plan. So it starts on the left corner with what I can already do. So it says, I am making baba sounds. The next goal is I will engage in back and forth babbling with my caregiver. How you can help me reach my goal provides three strategies for the family to use to help the baby engage in back and forth babbling. It's a menu, so basically families will pick which of these strategies works best for them or the one that they may find the most appealing because sometimes you offer a strategy and they go, yeah, no, I will never do that. Um, Finally, why it is important really is a message from the baby to say, why should I do this? And this, this why it's important is in the, in the words of the baby saying why this matters. So an example from here is engaging in communication where we give and take sets me up for later conversations in life. I will learn that when I stop talking, you start. And when you stop talking, it's my turn. Isn't that lovely? I think that's a really um, nice way to engage families into the developmental support plan. 
everything is written in the voice of the child. So it's not a you should or parents ought to. It's really a baby saying, this is what I need from you. And why do I need this? This is because, and they give a really good explanation of what skills they're building. So um, the goal is to focus on the child's skill or behavior. And it's, it's okay if a child's not at their um, chronological age. They can actually do um, a skill at a level where they're at. And we wanna meet the child where they're at, not at where their, chronicolo where their chronological age says they should be. The goal should be challenging, but tangible. So we want to just do a tiny push for that child, just to push them to, to meet a new skill, but not, not really big goals that make it unachievable because that's frustrating one for the baby, but it's also frustrating and demoralizing for parents. The goals are kept simple. They're one sentence, but they're very specific. And um, there's no, we don't want to use any jargon or complicated language. Um, and we don't want to use language like he will continue to or she will be able to. It's all about she can or he can do this. He, um, she can do that. And using positive language. Um, if appropriate, the goals may reflect the seven grandfather teachings. And those are love, respect, bravery, honesty, humility, wisdom, and truth. And finally, the manual actually spells out a lot of these um, goal activities and strategies it gives you this information so you don't have to make it up so if we go back to the previous plan you need to come up with what i can already do and once you have that you can go to the manual and find the next goal and the strategies are in the manual if you can't think of any strategies and if that's not good enough why this is important is also in the manual. So if you can't think of why this is important, there's already something in the manual that you can use to get you started. Keeping culture in mind, we always want to remember that every family has its own culture. So culture is um, more than just big culture writ large, but also that each family has its own culture. And we are currently evaluating the Nurturing the Seed resource. We've got um, an evaluation study underway using OCAP principles. And the study's taking place from last year, 2019 to 2021. And it's happening in six communities across Canada. And here's where they are. So that's it from us. Um, Donna and I would be happy, happy to answer questions. Mm -hmm. And we already have two questions, but this is your opportunity to type in questions. So we have um, a good 15 minutes that we can answer them. Can you hear me okay? So the first question is, what should inform your plan? Are there specific examples of validated screening tools you recommend? So informing the plan, we talked about um, conversations with parents, um, observations, and for the validated screening tools, we use the ages and stages questionnaires. Um, those of you who are familiar with them will be, you'll be off to the races because you'll know what I'm speaking about. But the ages and stages questionnaires are parent reported so they're parent completed um, they're written in in pretty simple language so they're accessible to many families and they also um, have we use two of the tools one is called the ages and stages um, three and that's the third version of the ages and stages questionnaire but it also has a social emotional counterpart so the second um, screening tool we use is the ages and stages so um, social emotional two and that's the second version of the social emotional tool and when you use those together you get a really fulsome view of who this child is and where their areas of strength are and if there are any areas of concern um, scoring it is is you are required to have some training to learn how to score and interpret the results 
but the results can really help you then build the plan because you'll see very easily what domains the child is struggling in, um, if any, and it also helps parents learn more about their child. So often a parent will say, I didn't know she could do this, or, oh, was he supposed to do that at this age? I, I didn't. I didn't think they would do that till they're much older. So it often um, raises some really good information for parents as they fill it out as well. So those are the ASQ, the Ages and Stages Questionnaires. Another nice piece about the ASQ is they're non-clinical tools. So anybody can use them once they know how to use them. So that makes it very accessible to families and um, as well when you're going through these tools um, you can skip questions if they're not applicable to the family or if they don't want to answer that for a culture specific reason uh, so there's a little bit of flexibility in the tools as well but they are just there to give a really good picture of where that child is developmentally and I think the other tools that we use as, as service providers are our observation tools. And there might be other, other screening questionnaires, such as the maternal stress index that you might like to use with families. Um, but I think the important thing to keep in mind is the, the, um, the family is the one who would decide whether or not they, are, they want to answer those questions or, or complete that questionnaire. So we, we've been careful in our evaluation to let the communities determine which questionnaires are going to be most helpful with the, with the, um, the families that we're working directly with. So the next question, the second part of that's been answered with the Val of Data Development Screening Tools, but the first part is, will you share examples of developmental support plans? So we can send you a draft, a PDF developmental support plan, and we'll make sure to um, pass that along to our friends at Best Start, and, and we'll absolutely share them. Um, the tools are available from Infant Mental Health Promotion. They do require, um, the ASQ training that we do requires training, and we, also, we offer training in the DSPs with a commitment for some um, coaching and mentoring as well. Um, what we find is, I don't know about you, but throughout my career, I've got a billion uh, manuals sitting on my bookshelf. And they're really well intended that I was got this manual out of training and I was going to use it and it was going to be great. But to really get it off the ground, we found that our work is most effective when we can work with you after the training and provide support and really see it um, in action and, and really do more than just train and hope. So if you want more information, our emails are um, at the end and we would love to have a conversation with you about using these resources. That's great. Here's a really good question that two people have asked. What is the difference between bonding and attachment? So at, attachment, I'll, I'll field this one for, for a change because usually Joanne will field this type of question. So attachment is really about when and how the parent or the caregiver responds to the child when they are in distress. So when a baby is crying because they're afraid, they're hungry, they're hurt or uncomfortable, they cry and show their distress and a caregiver responds to that distress either by providing um, nurturing attention or by being dismissive and, and ignoring those cues. Obviously, or, or uh, hopefully it's obvious that ignoring those cues is not going to build the secure attachment that we want to see in families. A, a baby will attach to anyone or with a different type of attachment. So there are various different sort of classifications of attachment um, that we see in that um, parent-child dyad. Um, whereas bonding is more about getting to know your child, right? So it's not only when they're in distress, but it's being playful and building, helping the child build their sense of self versus attachment, I think is more focused on security, building the sense of trust 
and uh, being able to understand that the world is a safe place. And and bonding is driven by the adult. So in it, it can start in pregnancy, and that's not uncommon for someone to fall in love with, with their baby when they're pregnant, right? Um, but it also happens sometimes after a baby is born that people don't bond with their baby right away. And the difference, I think, between the two is that bonding is not predictive of psychopathology. So if it takes you a while to bond with your child, that's okay. It's, it's, it's okay. If you don't have a secure attachment, if you have um, if you have an insecure attachment with your baby, um, it can it can lead to some some problems down the road in a way that bonding does not. And attachments driven by the baby, so it develops from when the baby is born, they start to form an attachment. But babies are not born attached to anyone just because they were born to one particular person. They form the attachment based on their interactions over time, and that defines whether it's a, a positive attachment or a negative attachment. Okay, so we've got a couple more questions. Thank you, John. Great answer there. Um, uh, so somebody's thinking for an, for you for an answer from an earlier question, and you mentioned accessing a manual to gain ideas of information for developmental support plan. Can you share where we can find or access this manual? Yeah, so we're we're just in the process of sort of revamping our website. Um, so very shortly, we will have some uh, documents that will sort of outline, provide a. Uh, um, a case perhaps or an ex a sample of what a finished developmental support plan would be um, and more details are forthcoming as to how you can access the full training and resources through our website. Uh, so we hope to have some new videos up for instance that kind of walk you through the, the various steps um, and, and how to use the the menu of strategies that's provided in the nurturing seed uh, uh, resource or sort of library of strategies and how you can pull those together to um, select strategies that are specific to the child and relevant to the family and tweak those. So it's a bit of a process developing the plan itself. It's not just like a snap, 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 snap. snap. Um, you really do need to understand the child and family's needs, um, understand what their next goal might be to support development, and then be able to go in and create that plan with and or for that family using the tool. So it's a big process. We're very happy to help people go through that or, or show you samples or examples. So please do email us. I think are we on the next slide for so here are our email addresses. Please yes uh, write them down, add us to your address book. <laughs> We're happy to answer any questions or send you samples. And we've got a couple more questions right now. We have one about language. Um, so just in regards to writing goals without will be able to kind of language, could you provide an example of goal writing with more positive language? That's a nice question. So if I'm understanding it correctly, like saying, uh, rather than saying, Johnny's going to stop doing X, how do you make that a strengths-based goal? You. Yeah, so um, I, first I'm going to talk about strengths because often people struggle to find the strength of the child and the child who throws the temper tantrum all the time is actually very effective at communicating their they're, they're, if they're not getting what they want or to let you know what they do want. Often tam temper tantrums are really effective ways of communication. So without being trite, we actually will write in the, the plan, I am able to use temper tantrums to get my needs met. And what the next goal may be is, I will learn to use a word to tell you what I need. So the strategies may be um, that the parent, if the child wants something and points to it, the parent may say the word and wait for the child to, 
to repeat the word back. So it would be worded in the, the voice of the child. So it may say something like, when I want something, I will point at it and mommy will say the name of the word and give me time to repeat the word back to her. So that's an example, I think, of how we use positive um, goals for everything that is done for the child. And really, everything that a child does in terms of behavior is, is communication. And so even if it's behavior that we may not like, it's, it's serving a purpose. And it really is, um, if, if babies can't communicate at all, that's a real problem. And if they can't communicate in a positive way, then that will be the goal. Okay, so we've got a couple more questions about the training and we have one question that may not be able to be answered very easily and quickly. So I'm just gonna read that, but if it's too long, we can always send you some separate uh, information. I believe an infant should sleep in mom's bed, not in a crib in another room. Is this okay or is it still being frowned upon? Sleeping in a bed in a crib in, in another room versus having the child in the it's room. Sleeping in the bed with the mom. I think sleep is a really controversial and sort of um, area where it really is dependent on the family and their needs. Um, it might be the best thing for that child to have um, a safe space um, to sleep and as long as the parents are uh, um, responding to their needs like um, that might be the the ideal situation for that family it, it's so um, there, there's no one way I think for for sleep to happen for a family it's uh, you have to consider the the developmental age of the child and their needs um, uh, their needs for comfort first, perhaps, or, and, um, yeah, yeah. and for safety, yes, of course, yes, uh, always having a safe indeed. space, yeah. Then we've got a couple more about the training. Uh, one is, um, what is the literacy level of the pre-filled goals, activities, and strategies sheets? We try to keep those at, like, maximum grade six literacy. Um, but since they're in the voice of the child, they can and should be um, drafted, if you will, um, in whatever language is going to be most comprehensible for the family. Uh, so you can you can absolutely change that language if if you need to incorporate another language. You can absolutely do that. Um, you can tweak everything, which I think is part of the beauty of this of this project. It's really about the child, the family, and, and addressing their needs and supporting them. Um, and will this training be beneficial for groups who already have ESP training? Yeah, Ab absolutely. So um, we can customize the training to include ASQ training or not. If you have the ASQ training, um, we really encourage you to have the SE training as well, the social emotional training. So if you're only using the ASQ3, um, I think you're missing a big picture of that child. So um, it's all negotiated on a case by case um, basis and uh, send us an email. We'd be happy to discuss options with you for sure. Mm -hmm. Good. And there was another question about the positive language. I believe that's been answered. I hope that's been answered. And then somebody mentioned um, not being able to download the handout. We will send out the handout via email as well. And uh, we will have access to the recorded webinar as well. Yes. So um, we're, it's time to end the webinar. And I'd like to thank Joanne and Donna for a great presentation today on um, infant and early childhood mental health in an, in an Indigenous context, and also for sharing um, the great resource uh, Nurturing the Seed with us. Um, you will be receiving an email with the link to the recording of this webinar, and there will also be an evaluation link um, sent to you. Your feedback is extremely important to us. Um, a reminder that in the handouts tab, you'll find a PDF of today's slides, and then you can download those um, for your, um, you know, to look at them again. 
and to also um, please visit our uh, Best Start website for other upcoming webinars at www.beststart.org. So thank you everyone and if you have any questions um, after this webinar and you'd like um, you know to ask uh, either myself, um, Joanne or Donna any questions, our emails are there. We, we would be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you everyone. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much.